Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. James Lehman. I'm going to be sharing my screen here one sec. And there we go. Uh, pull up my PowerPoint. Okay, so can everybody see my slides there? Yep, we got it. Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Lehman. Um, I'm coming to you from San Antonio, Texas, right here. Um, I'm in private practice. I do cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery. Um, no relevant financial disclosures for this talk. Um, if I fail to mention it, we're going to be talking about penetrating keratoplasty today, preoperative considerations, and intraoperative steps. Um, I've done a lot of work overseas teaching cornea transplants with Site Life and with Orbis, most recently in Jerusalem, Peru, India, and China. Um, so before we get started, um, we're going to do some poll questions for the audience. Um, just so I have an idea uh, about uh, the experience of the audience, um, the first question would be, um, I have performed penetrating keratoplasty, number one, never, number two, one to 20 cases, number three, 21 to 50 cases, and then the fourth would be 51 plus cases. So just penetrating keratoplasty. Okay, so it looks like the, um, the audience has uh, limited experience, probably in the 1 to 20 or never cases. So um, what we're going to do with this um, presentation is kind of give you an overview of cornea transplantation then, and um, not so much detail into the mechanics, because that kind of takes some live surgery to do, but we'll go over all the uh, preoperative considerations and intraoperative steps. So another question before we get started, um, this is one of those um, questions we'll address in the lecture, but which of the following is not a contraindication to penetrating keratoplasty? So not a contraindication. Ocular cicatrical pemphigoid or mucous, memf mucous membrane pemphigoid, an untreated, untreated exposure, keratoconus with scar, or active graft-versus-host disease. All righty, looks like the audience got that one right. So we'll go into some of these when we talk about contraindications. Um, when performing penetrating keratoplasty, which is true, the donor trephination should be larger than the recipient, or the recipient trephination should be larger than the donor? Submit your answers to that. All right, looks like the audience uh, was on the spot with that one. And then the last question, if uh, a patient has a corneal scar that requires a transplant and a mild cataract, the surgeon should, number one, perform a PK3, that's a triple, that's a cataract surgery, cornea transplant, cataract surgery, and lens implant, or the surgeon should just do the, the transplant, then months later return for the cataract, or they should take the cataract out first and then months later do the transplant, or should they ditch a transplant and just do a DMEC? So go ahead and answer that. And we'll go into the logic behind this question uh, a little later in the presentation. So submit your answers and then we'll move along. All right, so a little bit of question on this one. So we'll talk, we'll talk a little more about this one. Okay, so a little overview of the talk. First, we're gonna talk about the background of corneal transplantation, and then we'll talk about patient selection, and then how we choose a donor, and then how we plan for surgery, how we do the surgery, and then how we deal with any problems during the surgery. So in terms of background, this is a photo of a patient who had a penetrating keratoplasty back in the 1960s in New York with Dr. Castro Viejo. Um, it's a square transplant, as you can see, and um, at this time they didn't have any kind of absorbable or even nylon sutures, so they would use uh, steel, sometimes wire, to do this. The patient would be in the hospital. The donors were very old, and these would go into young patients. At the time I took this picture, the graft was about 100 years old, based on the time that it was transplanted in the 60s. So what we'll be talking about today is the evolution of of that surgery, which is a PK, which stands for a full thickness replacement of the cornea. All right, and obviously the, the goal of this is to clear up the visual axis and give the patient, you know, usable vision. So just a little overview. In the United States, uh, we were, there's about 50,000 grafts done each year. And if you look back to 2005, the vast majority of those were penetrating keratoplasty. But if you follow my line here, we're down to under 20,000 full transplants a year. We do more endothelial transplants than, than, than full transplants now. And in terms of indication for transplants, if you look in 2016, the majority of them is for, are for keratoconus and repeat transplants, okay? Um, when we talk again about the indications for PK in the US, um, at the top of it is keratoconus. And then if you look right here, then we have repeat corneal transplants, 
and then we have other causes of corneal dysfunction or distortion. So this differs in different countries. In the United States, like I said, it's with keratoconus, repeat grafts, and perforations. That's just here. But if you go somewhere to India, for example, who does about the same number of, they do about the same number of transplants as the United States each year, um, theirs are majority, majority are for therapeutic um, grafts for corneal ulcers, uh, fungal that don't respond to medications, and then optical for a regraft. Sorry, that's an error. It says redraft, it should say regraft. And then I did a little research in Colombia, for example, based on this article, the number one indication was for bullous keratopathy and then therapeutic for an ulcer and then corneal dystrophies. So I'll talk briefly, but when we say the word therapeutic transplant, what we're talking about is putting tissue on the eye to stop an infection or to stop a perforation, not necessarily for vision. Oftentimes the tissue would be a marginal quality that may not provide years of adequate um, vision. Um, so normally that's done to stabilize the eye and then an optical graft is done. Uh, in the United States, uh, we don't always use quite that same distinction because of the availability of tissue, but in the rest of the world, that's kind of the terminology that's used. So in terms of patient selection, I mean, there's certain no-nos, right? Anybody who has active inflammation on the eye, so if you look in this bottom picture here, that's, you know, that's cicatrical pemphigoid. If somebody has active ocular cicatrical pemphigoid, no graft is going to do well. Even if it were dormant, you'd have problems. But the bottom line is you have to get all this inflammation under control. So these are all bad things like bad dry eye, Steven Johnson syndrome, limbal stem cell deficiency, exposure. Here's a picture of some cicatrical ectropion causing exposure. A graft in this scenario wouldn't do well because it wouldn't epithelialize nicely. So more contraindications. Active infection, unless the goal is to, to fix that infection. Things like HSV. You know, doing grafts on patients with HSV, they need to be on systemic uh, antiviral medication like Valtrex. The eye needs to be quiet several months before you do a surgery. Another one that is kind of under the radar are uncontrolled glaucoma. So if a patient has high pressure, you want to get the pressure fixed before you do the transplant because the graft will fail because of high pressure. It'll also inhibit epithelialization. It'll muddy the waters in terms of is the inflammation, excuse me, is corneal swelling from rejection or is it from pressure? So it's very important to control the glaucoma prior to doing a penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, lastly, these two would be multiple previous rejections. So if somebody's had three corneal transplants, and you're the guy or the gal doing the fourth one, you know your chance of success is very small and you may need to consider a different modality such as a K-Pro. Um, lastly is the inability to care for a PK. So if a patient uh, is gonna, you're gonna do the surgery and then you're never gonna see them again or they're gonna move far away, something like that, that's not a good recipe for a, a successful transplant. You know, a transplant's a lifelong connection between the doctor and the the patient and so the patient needs adequate follow-up they need to understand they need to be on drops for life to prevent rejection they need you know steady follow-up to look for things and most uh, eye surgeries you can kind of do the surgery and then you know uh, the patient doesn't really need to return on a schedule because they can kind of feel if something's wrong but with a transplant and also kind of with glaucoma surgery you know you need to have interval follow-up so that you can make sure that mm, the graft is doing okay the sutures are good etc um, so again, some indications. Here's a fungal keratitis. You know, this would be more common um, as the number one indication in India, for example. Um, in the United States, we do do therapeutic transplants when, when patients don't respond because there are some fungi that just won't respond to any topical, intrastromal, et cetera, medications. Here's a, a picture of a failed graft that's very vascularized. Um, this is probably the second or third graft on this patient. And another graft would probably uh, end up the same way. So in this situation, you may be looking at, you know, a different modality. So I received some questions prior to the webinar. One was from Milos uh, Kovacevic, um, and he asked for keratoconus, is PK or DAUG better? So we were kind of talking about indications for surgery here, and now we'll, we'll move to just a sidebar here, but um, what is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty? Well, you can see here on the picture, it would be leaving the back, you know, one to 10% of the cornea and then putting on a, a recipient in which the endothelium and decimates have been removed. Uh, DALC is probably superior in keratoconus, no doubt about it. And the main reason is that you have less a chance of rejection. You can get still get stromal rejection, you can get epithelial rejection, but you don't get endothelial rejection, and that's a big that's a big plus. Um, 
there's a there's probably a less susceptibility to traumatic dehiscence if the patient suffered trauma. But the main thing is that if you have a problem, you can kind of bounce back from it with a DALC. Whereas in a PK, it's not so it's not so easy to bounce back from a rejection episode or um, <clears throat> or you know forgetting their drops, getting a, a wound dehiscence, et cetera, things like that. So the answer to your question, Milos, is that DALC is better in keratoconus. Okay, so let's talk about donor cornea selection. Um, so here in the United States, when I, uh, I'm i gonna plan a penetrating keratoplasty, I uh, send a notice to the to the eye banking organization. In this sense, in this, in this instance, it's uh, Carolink. Um, and I tell them what day I'm gonna have the surgery, uh, what the age of the patient is, and then they send me a sheet like this. And the sheet is very nice. It has all the statistics. There's a lot of stuff on here, so for Many of you who don't have experience with corneal transplants, I'll kind of run through the pertinent statistics. All right, number one, the age of the of the decedent. That's the person who's died here, okay? Um, we generally like to use corneas age 15 to 65, and we try to match the donor age um, to the recipient age because, um, well, for obvious reasons. Um, you don't want to put a 90-year-old cornea on a 20-year-old. Um, and so uh, you also look at the date of death. So that's right here. So you wanna calculate the difference between when the patient died and then when we're gonna do the surgery. And you want that to be under 12 days generally. It's FDA approved for up to 14, but there's some data suggesting that, um, the, that under 12 days would be, would be uh, the best. Um, I've used them up to 14 and it's totally fine. Um, just a, a small trend towards improved outcomes in DSEC for under 12 days of use. Um, the last thing is what's called the D to P. That's the death to preservation time. That's from when the when the decedent died and when um, the the corneas were harvested and put into solution. And so, oftentimes uh, they are cooled. The body is cooled. So if the patient or the decedent dies in a hospital, they can cool it down in the morgue. And so if the uh, you want the body cooled if possible, and the acceptable D to P is somewhere between about 15 to 20 hours. If it's cooled, you can go up to 20 hours, no problem. Um, lastly, we want to get a cell count. Now, a cell count, just the number itself, is not terribly helpful. It's better to see the picture of the endothelium itself. So we get specular microscopy images uh, on these sheets, and that helps to so that you can verify because this is just a small snippet in the middle of the cornea of the of the endothelium. You don't have an idea of the entire endothelium, and so you could have bad things in the other part. But at least it gives you an idea of the uniformity and the size of the endothelial cells. And what you want to look for is about the same size and you want these nice hexagon uh, shaped cells. Lastly, you look at the clear zone because uh, a lot of times the donors, if they're older, they're going to have a lot of arcus and they'll have um, a limited clear zone. And if you're going to need to do a graft that's nine millimeters, but the clear zone is only seven and a half, you don't want to choose that cornea because then the recipient will have white lines around their, um, uh, around their graft. So again, that's what's on the sheet here. Um, it also gives a little history about what happened to the patient, uh, et cetera. Um, a question from the audience that was sent in earlier, this was from Wanjuku Mathengi from Rwanda, is what do you consider a, as good tissue for a PK and what will you not accept? So um, that's kind of what we're talking about here. I guess I wouldn't accept like an 85 year old cornea. I wouldn't accept a, a date of death that was 14 or 15 days. If the death to preservation time were greater than 20 hours, I wouldn't take it. And if the cell count were less than 2,500, I would be reticent to take it. So those are kind of the stats that I use as my baseline. Every surgeon has different ones and there've been some big studies that help to kind of sort it out a little. So um, as you remember in ophthalmology residency, there's some big studies like the OAT study for glaucoma and the ETDRS study for diabetes. Uh, for diabetic retinopathy. Well, for cornea, there's a thing called the corneal donor study that was done about um, about 20 years ago. It was a multi-center study, and it was the looking at the, the difference in outcomes between uh, 12 and 65 and 66 to 75 year olds. Um, and essentially, the results were that at five years, which is over here on the right, there was no significant difference in the outcomes. Um, and so, this is kind of what opened up the this is kind of what opened up the door to using older tissue. Um, now, a lot of cornea surgeons are still reticent about it, but you can have quite good success. And as we do more endothelial keratoplasty, sometimes older donors are, um, are more useful because, for example, in DMEC, it's easier to unscroll the, 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 
the desmase membrane in an older patient than a younger. Oftentimes, patients will ask me, do I have to have uh, blood type matching or do I have to have uh, HLA matching, like you have to have for solid organ transplantation? Um, and, uh, you know, we tell them no. Uh, there was some, not a huge study, but a study done in the 80s looking at this at high-risk transplants and if you've matched up the HLA. And there didn't seem to be any benefit for at uh, three years from that. So we've kind of gone away from that. Now, in Europe, I think there's a little more of this, but I'm not that familiar with that. Um, so what does the cornea go into? Well, it goes into many different solutions, but in the United States, the most popular one is this one, Optisol, okay? And this was invented in the late 80s. Before then, you had to keep it in short-term storage, either a moist chamber or the MK medium. And so you had to use the cornea pretty fast. Now we can save it up to 14 days. And essentially, it's a buffered uh, solution that has nutrients, antibiotics, um, and there's been a, a push to, to put amphotericin in there to help decrease um, the chance of a fungal, uh, post-op fungal keratitis. It's strange, but in penetrating keratoplasty, fungal keratitis is not a huge issue, but it is in endothelial keratoplasty. It seems with the second DMEC, there's a predilection or at least a higher incidence of this. And so there's been new exploration of putting amphotericin into the, uh, into the solution. It's done in, in, in Europe, but in Europe they do organ culture um, so in, in many eye banks there. So um, anyway, the bottom line is that um, the intermediate term solution is the most popular. It's this one. In India, it's called corneosol. And at the current time, it doesn't have amphotericin, but it does have um, antibiotics. Um, these lastly, these long-term storage organ culture is where you keep um, uh, the tissue warm and uh, in kind of physiologic condition, you can use it longer than 14 days, or you can, uh, you know, freeze it or do gamma irradiation, but then you're, you, you, you don't have any more endothelium. Um, so when somebody passes away, they want to donate their corneas. Uh, there are some things that we have to make sure they don't have. Okay. So review the medical and social history, uh, and we do serologic testing. Okay. So serologic testing, it's basically for hepatitis, HIV, and syphilis. What's not required um, is what's listed um, here. Uh, now, for some solid organs, you have to test for these, but not for corneas, okay? So HTLV, EBV, CMV, Chagas, West Nile, these are not routinely checked for uh, in corneas. Um, so in the United States, for example, in 2014, 10,000 corneas tested positive for communicable diseases, and the majority of them were hepatitis, either Hep B or Hep C. Now, a lot of them you'll see here, why were these tested if we don't routinely test for HTLV or West Nile. The reason why was the donor was also a solid organ donor, and so these were done at the same time. Um, and then iBanks have become sophisticated institutions, as many of you know. Um, they don't just give you the cornea, right? They investigate it, they make sure it's okay. So using this uh, viewing chamber and a little mount on a slit lamp, like you can see here, they look for exposure, infiltrates, clear zones, anything that may rule out the so if, for example, the donor, uh, the decedent was uh, in the ICU on a ventilator and developed exposure keratopathy with subsequent infection, you'd see like a little white line in the cornea, possible infiltrate. You really wouldn't want to use that cornea, even for a endothelial surgery. And then lastly, we do donor specular microscopy. And Conan has devised a, a gizmo like this where you put the viewing chamber. It takes beautiful pictures. So for those of you not too familiar with specular microscopy, um, this would be considered a, you know, a beautiful scan here. You see uniform uh, endothelial cells. Here you would see what we call polymegatheism. This is uh, bigger cells, right? They're kind of moving to take up the space. So this would have a lower cell count. This one may be borderline. You may not want to use it. Here you see some heterogeneity of the cells, pleomorphism, uh, suggestive of some uh, hypooxygenation or another condition that uh, means the cornea is not in great shape. And then here you see guttata or gutte as would be present in Fuchs corneal dystrophy. And so you probably wouldn't want to use this cornea there. So uh, we have a lot of toys at the eye bank that make us uh, be able to plan the surgery a lot nicer. Okay, so preoperative planning. Um, there's several things you have to think about, okay? The first is what kind of anesthesia we use for the patient. The next is uh, what, what are we gonna do with the lens? Are we gonna leave it alone or do we need to do something with it? Lastly, there's some unique situations. One would be a failed, previous failed graft and you have to decide if I'm redoing the PK, am I gonna re repeat the trephination or am I gonna try to remove the current one? Or if I have a failed PK, do I wanna go and do an endothelial transplant on them? 
or if I have a failed PK, do I need to move to a different procedure like a Boston or oral lab keratoprosthesis? <clears throat> Sorry about that. So anesthesia for penetrating keratoplasty. Um, different parts of the world use different kinds of anesthesia, okay? Um, the goal is obviously that the patient's comfortable and that the eye's not moving. There's some added risk involved with penetrating keratoplasty as the globe is open for, you know, at least 10 to 15 minutes of the procedure. And so you really need to have good akinesia and the patient needs to be comfortable. They can't be coughing. They can't be wiggling around. They can't be doing Valsalva. And so you really need to kind of get to know your patient and make sure that, 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 that you choose the correct type of anesthesia. So most of the cases I do are with retrobulbar anesthesia. Um, but there are some cases of general if the patient's younger or if uh, I don't feel like they can they can stay still during the surgery and at the end of the case if we're doing a general I do give somewhat of a peribulbar block to help with anesthesia or analgesia rather um, so as I was saying what kind of anesthesia for the PK so you need to make sure that the patient can lay still you have to make sure they understand so if the patient has any kind of hearing issues moderate mental or dementia, something like that, or if they have moderate or uh, low IQ, things like this where they can't really follow orders, you need to maybe go for general anesthesia. You also have to consider, do I need to be doing more things? Like if I'm going to suture in an IOL and I'm going to do extra manipulations, I need that eye still, I want to decrease the risk of a supracortal hemorrhage, so I may, I may lean more towards doing general anesthesia when I have to fixate an ocular, intraocular lens. I find like male patients in their 20s and 30s, they're not very good with, um, not very good with just uh, local anesthesia, the anxiety and things. So you kind of have to get a feel for your patient. And I would suggest many of you that if you haven't done transplants, definitely in your first several uh, cases, you want to do them under general anesthesia so that you're not pressured during the suturing of the, of the donor. Um, when we do retro bulbar anesthesia, we use this needle. It's called an Atkinson needle. As you know, it's kind of blunt at the tip. Um, there are risk factors with retro bulbar anesthesia, as you know, all of these listed right here. But um, generally, it, it's safe, and if you've done thousands of them, you do a good job, and the eyes, um, uh, you know, akinetic, and the patient doesn't have any pain. Um, one thing I'll mention is we do use hyaluronidase in our blocks. The blocks are normally lidocaine. 2% uh, without epinephrine and bupivacaine 0.75%. Uh, that's a little longer acting agent. And then um, we put some hyaluronidase to help diffuse the block. And normally that gives you about two hours of a rock solid globe and then about six hours of analgesia. So pre-surgical planning, lens management, okay? So here's an intraocular lens and here's a case where the patient has corneal scarring and, and a cataract, okay? And so there's different scenarios here. Um, one would be the patient just has a mild cataract. The, the, the other one would be the patient has a very bad cataract. And then these kind of fit together. Does the patient already have an IOL and it's not in good position? Because obviously if it is in good position, you're going to leave it alone. Um, does the patient have an ACIOL that's not fitting correctly? Um, or do they have a lens that's rubbing against the iris causing you, you know, UV, uveitis and glaucoma? Or are they aphakic? So we'll go through a few of these scenarios. Obviously, in your first few transplants, you want to leave the lens alone because it does add an, an element of difficulty to it. So if somebody has a mild to moderate cataract, so in this picture, corneal scarring, pretty decent lens, the before or after, this is the most common scenario. This would be, you know, this would be, uh, you know, what would you say, like maybe a 40-year-old with keratoconus, something like that, or a 50-year-old that has some kind of cataract. So in this situation, you want to leave the cataract alone. It makes the case go faster, it's safer, uh, and you can get a better result long term if you do the transplant, you perform the suture management for six to nine months afterwards, and then you come back and you do fake emulsification on the patient. Because then any kind of refractive error, especially spherical, you can correct with the IOL six months later. The astigmatism that would be present, I would hesitate to put in a toric lens because um, the graft astigmatism can change over time, and if they ever need a different graft, it's going to be, uh, you have to remove the, the lens that you have. So a uh, question from the audience that was submitted prior to the webinar was from Rajashri Das, um, and it was about the management of post-op astigmatism. So I'm just going to briefly go into that because we're not talking too much about post-op stuff, but this is the graft uh, suturing technique that I use. It's 12 interrupted sutures like the 
hours on a clock, and then there's one running suture that goes around. So I experimented with a different type of of sutures, and most of my colleagues nowadays just do 16 um, interrupteds, but I like this the best because you put these interrupteds in first, and they're tighter than the running suture, and then about four months after surgery, after the uh, you know, eyes healing up, you bring the patient in and we do topography on them, okay? And so you can see here, this would be January 2013, four months post-op. And I have these interrupted sutures and then here's the running suture. We do topography, which isn't the best in the world. You can see the irregular surface. This is common in a transplant. You don't get the greatest topos. Um, and it's telling me I have about 3.75 you know, diopters of sill. It generally in this direction, okay? Um, and so we remove some sutures, you move them on the steep axis and we remove the interrupted sutures, okay? Not the running. And then you bring the patient back in a month. So now we're February the 19th. Now we're getting some better pictures, okay? And you can see what sutures are still present. There's one here, there's one there, there's one there. And look where the sill is, okay? So the sill now is eight diopters. You're getting a prettier picture. It's a month after the original uh, suture removal. And so I know I need to move some sutures on this. So I'd probably remove these, these two. And then you bring them back. This is now six months post-op. This is March. And you're getting a better shape here. Um, the, the astigmatism is still irregular. You're measuring about two diopters. And so I would probably stop at this point and then let the graft heal. And I would pretty much leave in the running suture for the patient's lifetime or unless it broke. That provides a safety measure and um, uh, and if, for example, you have removed all of the interrupted sutures and you still have high astigmatism, that would be for a different lecture. But at that point, I would remove the running suture and then I would um, uh, do any kind of uh, arcuate incisions or anything needed to, to improve the shape of the graft. So again, that's a little brief, uh, that's a little brief um, tutorial in astigmatism management after PK. Uh, another question from the audience was, from Manjanath Natarajan in India is what are the advantages and disadvantages of continuous interrupted sutures? So again, here's a picture of 16 interrupted sutures. This is the most common technique, okay? And then here's my technique with 12 and 12. So um, there's a couple of reasons why I like a combination of the two. The first one is that I can do suture removal earlier. Um, I can start removing sutures at four months because I have this running suture in between to help maintain graft integrity. If you have 16 byte and you remove one, you got a big space there. Or if you have a loose suture, you're more, much more likely to have a wound leak than you will in this scenario, okay? At an aesthetic level, look how much prettier this looks than this. If somebody sends you a patient for a corneal transplant and you send the patient, you know, they see them back and you just have these sutures like this, they're gonna say, man, I could do that. But if you have a pretty running suture like this, they're gonna say, wow, that was a good job. So I know that's kind of tongue in cheek, but in a sense, it's much prettier. And I think that it's safer. And if this is looser than the interrupteds, then you can move, remove the interrupteds and still keep this running suture for years and years uh, as a safety measure. All right, so the next scenario would be, what if the patient has a dense to mature cataract? Well, then you remove it at the same time of the, the corneal transplant. Um, here's a picture of a patient I took care of 10 years ago who had trauma and a traumatic cataract as well. So it, we're going to plan to, to do a, a cataract surgery as well. And this is the lens I like. Uh, you can do a silicone three-piece lens. What you don't want is a one-piece acrylic lens, okay? So a three-piece lens or a one-piece PMMA is fine because uh, with the technique to remove the cataract, you're not always certain that you can put it in the capsular bag. So you don't want a square edged acrylic um, one piece lens in this scenario. Um, so a three piece silicone is perfect. Even a three piece acrylic, eh, okay. Or this one piece PMA. So what case do you use? Well, you measure the axial length of the other eye. Most of the time you use that for the, the, the calculations. And then you use 45, 45 is the average case. Um, you need to use a Flaringer ring. We'll go into that a little bit. And then the technique is called open sky extra caps or cataract extraction. So we'll show a video of that, but uh, you don't fake it. Uh, you can, but it seems like it's a, a overkill. So I'll show you that technique later. Um, here's that patient again before and after. I also did some iris repair. Here's that 12, 12 and 12 pattern. Here's sutures from the original uh, scleral, uh, scleral rupture or corneal uh, laceration and the nice clear visual axis. So. Um, if the patient's gonna be aphagic at any point in the procedure, meaning they're aphagic or you're taking out a cataract, you need to use these Floringa rings. Um, and they come in different sizes and you, the location of it would be about one to two millimeters posterior to the limbus 
suture to the episclera with either silk or vicral sutures. They, main, they help to maintain the integrity, help to position the globe, and generally decrease the posterior pressure once the lens has been removed. So it's kind of like a box kite. So the question from the audience submitted before was from Bayanda Mbasia from South Africa, and is what is the advantage of using the Flinger ring? Any of you who have watched an open sky or done an open sky cataract surgery notice when you take the lens out of an eye, the eye shrinks down like a little raisin, okay? Like a deflated balloon. And that ring gives it some integrity. It's like a box kite. So you, you really uh, make your life easier when you put one on. Now, uh, I, uh, with my travels to different countries, I find many, many places they don't use these, but I find that it uh, minimizes the gray hairs. <clears throat> So here's an example of lens management. Okay, so here, this case has a decompensated cornea uh, with some vascularization, and then it has a one-piece acrylic IOL in the anterior chamber. So this is a no-no. So this lens needs to be removed. Now, one could debate in this case whether the patient needs a PK versus endothelial keratoplasty. Um, without examining the patients, it's difficult, but let's assume they need a PK. So at, you would do, I mean, I would recommend general anesthesia, I would recommend a flaringa ring, removal of this IOL, and a sutured in IOL at the same time as doing the PK, okay? If you could do endothelial keratoplasty on this patient, I'd recommend a two-stage procedure. The first one in which you remove the IOL, suture in a new lens, and then the third, uh, second procedure doing a DMEC. So uh, in this scenario, what do you use to suture in that lens? Well, there's two main lenses that people use here in the United States when they're gonna suture one in. And it's either this Alcon CZ70BD or it's the um, um, Bausch & Lomb Acrios. Both of them have little loopholes in the haptics that allow you to suture it. I prefer using Gore-Tex suture. This is an off-label use of Gore-Tex, which is not uh, designed for the eye, but it doesn't ever break. So um, this is the best thing. If you're suturing it in with 10 proline, you're gonna have some suture breakage in the, you know, the years coming. Um, additionally, there's a renewed interest in, or a new interest rather, in this Yamani technique for scleral fixation of the haptics. Uh, I presume this could be done at the same time as a, a PK, but I have not done that. Uh, but this, this is going to be kind of on the horizon. And as you all go to meetings, I'm sure you'll find some videos with some expert surgeons doing this in combination with the open sky type um, procedures. So again, um, take out the bad lens, suture in a new one. You could choose either of these lenses and use the Gore-Tex suture. Uh, if somebody's aphakic, it's, it's, it's essentially the same. You look at this picture down here, decompensated cornea, no iris. This patient would benefit probably from the human optics artificial iris. Um, maybe could get away with endothelial keratoplasty in this patient, but if they have to do a PK, a fluoringa ring, um, sutured IOL, perhaps sutured iris, and then, um, PK. Okay, so uh, the a couple of unique scenarios here. Um, if somebody has a failed transplant, you have a couple of options. You do another transplant, you either do endothelial keratoplasty or you do something else like the Boston K-Pro, okay? Um, so the first decision is do you need to do another transplant or can you just replace the endothelium? So let's say the failed PK has an opacified cornea and they were seeing well prior to the graft failure. Um, so if they were seeing well with glasses or contacts prior to the graft failure, and the cornea has a good shape on astigmatism, there's only edema, there's not a lot of scarring or vascularization, then I would recommend endothelial keratoplasty in that case. But if somebody has a failed graft, and then you look at the graft, and it's got a terrible shape to it, they weren't able to wear contact lenses, or glasses, and they were just kind of hanging around with that cornea, then you need to repeat the transplant. If it has lots of scarring and vascularization, either repeat transplant or K-Pro. And so if you're gonna repeat the transplant, you got two options. You can either true fine again, outside of the, the area of the previous graft, or you can remove the graft, okay, uh, that's there. Now, if it's really a long time ago, or the graft is very small or lots of scarring, I like to tree fine again outside the area of the original graft. But if the dissection was done pre like recently, like you have primary graft failure and it's not even scarred in there, then I wouldn't retrepanate. I would just remove the one that's in there, okay? So that's a little bit higher level uh, surgery, but just kind of talking through that. So let's look at two scenarios here. So 
This is a patient with good previous vision and they have graft failure. You see a bulla right here in the central cornea. You see some vascularization. The eye looks a little angry. There's minimal scarring, okay? Um, so in here, I think endothelial keratoplasty would be the, would be the treatment of choice, either DMEC or DSEC. Now here's a different case. This is a vascularized scarred graft. We don't know how many grafts they've had before. Let's assume two or three, okay? If this is the first graft they rejected, one could, one could do another PK. But if this is the second or third, you need to go to do a K-Pro because you know you're not gonna have success. And so for those of you guys who don't know what a K-Pro is, this is what it looks like post-op. So you have a rim of donor cornea, and then inside of it is a PMMA cylinder that gives you a clear central optic. And in this patient, the patient's wearing a contact lens right here. You can see this, okay? And that's why there's some air bubbles right here. But um, again, this is a reasonable surgery that has good results, um, but a different topic for a different time. All right, guys, we're um, about 40 minutes through. I got about another 15, 20 minutes here. We'll talk a little bit, a bit about surgical technique. First, you have to prepare the recipient. You need to punch the donor. You need to tree find the recipient. There's a couple of special situations, and then you're gonna suture the cornea in. And so when you're preparing the eye, you need to do the following things. You need to place a fluoringer ring if necessary. You need to measure the corneal diameter and then mark the center. These are gonna help you to choose what size of tree fine you need, as well as uh, center that nicely. Most graphs, I do an 8.25 donor into an eight millimeter recipient. So there's that, that question. We wanna make the donor needs to be bigger than the recipient. Now, why is that? Because when you punch a donor, you're punching it from backwards, uh, from the endothelium side, and so that changes the, the, the shape a little bit, and this uh, gives you a better, um, a better fit. Some people oversize by 0.5, and I used to do that, but I found that my corneas were too, my K's were too steep, so I do it by 0.25. All right, so here's a video of, uh, of me placing the fluoringer ring. And so I've, I sized it and I see about a one to two millimeter gap here, you know, and that's what I like. And then you don't have to pass these radially. They can be oblique passes. And the first one can even be kind of just through the conge. Also, when you hold this fluoringer ring, you want to use 0.13 or, excuse me, 0.3 or 0.5 forceps, 0.12 or too fine. You'll mess up the tips. And so the, the, first, uh, the first two are always the hardest to get in there but I'm using like maybe 6.0 Vicryl in this case or 5.0 Vicryl. Now I'm getting it set there and you don't have to pass them from the center to out. You can pass them in whatever fashion you want. Episcleral bites and you want to get about four of them in there, okay? Uh, if the patient, even after the block has some, uh, the, the view's not centered like that, you can use another uh, fluoringer, uh, excuse me, another suture and kind of move the eye around so the, uh, the, the ring is helpful in that scenario, okay? So there we have the Flaringer ring. All right, so the next step is measuring, centering, and marking, okay? So once you have the ring on, you wanna measure the, the, the recipient cornea. And so let's say we measured it, it's 12 millimeters. Then you change the calipers to six and you measure and you mark the central cornea. Then you can measure the vertical diameter and this helps you to center the cornea. The whole point of finding the geometric center of the cornea and marking it is so when you do trephination, you have a good reference point because the vacuum tree fine has a cross on it. Now, I additionally like to place another smaller blunt tree fine to mark uh, the center of the cornea so that I know when I'm putting the vacuum tree fine on that I'm encompassing that area fully. And then I'm using a marking pin here just to mark that. So. That's about a seven millimeter cornea. And then lastly, you use what's called an RK marker. You can buy these at Academy and stuff. And that helps to place the sutures later in the case. So really you only need to mark the four cardinals. That's the most critical. But with that uh, marking uh, marker, we are able to do all that. So you have host corneal trephination. Now, obviously you've prepared the donor before you do this, okay? So you don't tree fine and then prepare the donor. I'm just showing this in surgical steps here and then we're gonna go to the donor. But the next step is generally the donor, okay? And so this takes an assistant. This tree fine here uh, has a little tube that's the suction and your, 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 your scrub tech will, will push in and I use those lines right there and I go on my little dot, I encompass the area that I had previously marked and then we get suction, okay? And now we have suction, you can still, it's lock, locked on the eye. Every, Quarter turn is about 60 to 70 microns, but I was twisting that pretty fast because it was in the air. Now I can feel it's, it hit the epithelium 
now I can feel that it's cutting into the stroma, okay? So you see I've slowed it down quite a bit. All right, I tree fine down to what I thought was appropriate distance. And then I like to enter in a controlled fashion. You can see aqueous and I always enter at this point right there because I'm right-handed. Now we're using a cohesive viscoelastic to fill the anterior chamber. And then the next, the next part involves the use of corneoscleral scissors. So if you ever have to buy instruments for PK, this is what you probably have to buy. You probably have almost everything else. And what you want to do in this step is excise the, you know, the, the recipient uh, cornea. And so the way you do it is you use these corneal scleral scissors that have blunt tips and the bottom of it is longer than the top. And the main thing here is you don't want to cut the iris. So you insert the scissors and then you have to turn these, these you insert the tips and then you have to, ins to rotate the scissors to be perpendicular to the cornea, okay? So that you're cutting up and down. If you're not perpendicular, you get a little ridge like this, okay, that you can see over here because I wasn't up and down. Now I chose this video because I later in it, I switched to some different scissors. And you can see these are curvier, okay? These are very, these are easier to use. Those other ones are more for dalk because they're blunter. Um, but uh, these, these more curved corneal scleral scissors are often easier to use. And so now we're removing the final, they're just kind of big and bulky and that's why I don't always like them. Uh, so now we've removed it and we have the cornea is open sky now, okay? Now, here you use Vanis scissors or corneal scissors to remove that little rim that I had talked about. So sometimes if you don't cut perpendicular, you get that little rim. And you, want, you, you don't have to remove too much of it, but you do want to move enough so that the, remove enough so that the graft sits nicely. All right. So then the donor preparation. This was done obviously prior to the step we talked about. I like to do this under the microscope and on this punch, I use a, a marking pin just to mark the inner circle so that I can center better. But it's easier to center it under the mi microscope. If you just try to eyeball it on the assistant stand or something, you don't get as good a result. So using the microscope, I like to center and I wanna see that I have all that purple rim inside the, inside the rim there. So once we have it, we punch it using the matching holes. This is a bigger graft, 8.75. And so you push down really hard and you kind of wiggle it so that it punches all the way through. Then you use your 0.3s and you spin it so that you, dis you uh, definitely uh, separate the, 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 the donor from the donor rim. And so here we are, uh, we put some Optisol in there and we cover it and then we go do that preparation. So two little side notes. Sometimes you have to put on a temporary K-Pro if you're doing a surgery with a retina colleague and here are the numbers for that. And then if you have to remove a cataract, um, this is a case that is, I did with Orbis in China. Um, here we've already put the ring, we removed the donor, and then you can see the cataract is fairly dense. Um, so we're drying off the bed there and then we're putting some vision blue to help stain the capsule. And then we're moving the vision blue and then you can do a can opener style capsulotomy here to, 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 uh, to remove the anterior capsule. You can see me kind of talking through the, I think this is done by the trainee at the time. And if you've never done a can opener style capsulotomy, um, you should because uh, it's a good skill to have. And you kind of want to go right around the edge of the iris and you make little cuts, kind of bringing them in. What you want to avoid are radial tears that externalize. So uh, here we're going all the way around. And that's the free anterior capsular leaflet, um, almost free. And then... I'll, I'll rewind here a little bit. You can see the lens just, once you remove the anterior capsule, the lens just wants to come up. So even though the iris isn't as big as the lens, it kind of will die a little bit. So I'm just using the cystotome, elevating a pole of the, the lens, and now we're gonna kind of spin it out. So we kind of spin it this way. So we kind of push here. So pretty easy there to get that that, that bad boy out of there. Now, you look here, it looks pretty clear. This lens didn't really have any um, cortex, so we didn't have to do cortex removal. We're putting a viscoelastic in, basically elevating a side of the iris so that you can insert this three-piece um, three lens. So you, the main thing is you can't get this into the bag. So you wanna just put a haptic underneath the, the iris and then do a technique in which you, in which you um, bend the, the trailing haptic forward, get this edge under the, under the iris and then torque your, your wrist up and release the, um, release the haptic while pushing down on the optic. Now you put a bunch of viscoelastic and you can proceed with the, 
donor corner suturing. So this was a video lent to me by Dr. Aldave. The main take home points here are that the most important sutures are the first four. Uh, we always start here at uh, the patient's head here is at 12 o'clock. And if you look, this is how you want to hold the, lens, the, the needle up here. You want to go almost all the way back, about three quarters, and it's at the tip of the needle holders. Okay? And this is the pass that you're trying to do. It's 90% thickness. Not 50 and not 100% because you get wound leak, but 90% but thickness. Okay? And so once you've passed it through, you always want to... Uh, do a 311 knot, okay, a surgeon's knot, and you want to lock it back onto the cornea. So everybody always asks, what kind of tension do you have to put on these sutures? Well, you don't want them incredibly tight, like the tightest that you can do, because you're going to have too flat of a cornea. You want moderate tension, okay? And the way that you know, like, how good your tension is comes at the end here after you pass the first, you know, the four sutures, okay? So he's passing another one here. Same thing pass through 90% thickness uses the uses his 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 uh, forceps here to to help pass the needle you want to go about one millimeter onto the donor and one millimeter onto the recipient okay you want to rotate that knot three one one and then after you've placed the four, the four cardinal sutures you dry the cornea and you can see this diamond okay that diamond tells you you have nice tension all the way around okay and that's the trick. If you have a funny looking diamond, then you know you have to replace one of these stitches, okay? Um, the last part we'll cover are just some intraoper intraoperative complications. So some bad things that can happen, right? You can perforate the sclera. You can make the wrong size trephination. You can have bleeding. You can have damage to the iris, etc. okay? And so when you're talking about anesthesia, as we mentioned before, Anesthesia is your friend. Don't hesitate to do a general anesthesia case if needed. In the United States, we have some body habitus like this. And th if the patient is not set in a reverse Trendelenburg, oftentimes this pressure can go this way and you can have increased posterior pressure during the procedure. <sighs> How to avoid scleral perforation when you're placing this ring? Well, first of all, you need to use a spatulated needle. That's like this, C or a tapered needle like this. You don't want a cutting needle like A and B or you're more likely to do it, okay? You also need to rotate the eye for comfort and remember to make oblique passes if necessary. Um, how to avoid improper trephination? You know, once the donor is cut, it's too late. So you need to confirm the tree find sizes with your team in the operating room and make sure that you have the right numbers. You always want the donor bigger than the recipient and you always have to cut the donor first. If the donor's too small, you get hyperopia, glaucoma, and you have wound leaks. If it's too big, you get steep case, myopia, and exposure. When you trephinate, again, donor bigger than host, 0.25 to 0.5 bigger. You just have to find the system that works for you then. And how to avoid misalignment? You need to mark the cornea with an RK. You need to make nice 90% thickness depths, and you need to confirm that you have that diamond at the end of the first four sutures. If you have bleeding, it may not be possible to avoid, but air is your friend, okay? First, in this case, I would do something like a pyridomy, but uh, if you have bleeding in the anterior chamber, just remove the, vis remove, remove the liquid from the AC once the eye is, uh, is open, and that'll help to stop the bleeding. And you can damage the iris during trephination. It's fairly common. So especially in your first few cases, you could fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic so that you see viscoelastic express when you cut, when you cut through endothelium. Oftentimes, you can not enter the anterior chamber with a tree fine. You can just uh, go down a certain depth and then enter using a super sharp in a controlled fashion. Um, and how to avoid trauma to the lens. Uh, well, uh, if you're doing any other ancillary procedures like iris repair and things, you need to, to lift the iris when passing the needle. You need to avoid excessive trephination. Um, if you're not going to do anything to the lens, you want to give pilocarpine preoperatively to get that pupil as small as possible. Uh, to avoid capsular rupture during the open sky, you need to be efficient and fast, and um, and you need to um, need to be delicate. Um, you need to make sure that the can opener capsular rexus is is uh, doesn't have any radial tears, and you need to avoid excessive manipulation. And when you do cortex removal, you need to make sure you're not pulling on the capsule that you're pulling on the cortex. 
Uh, if you do have capsule rupture, you can inject some Kinelog and perform an open sky vitrectomy to remove the, any vitreous prolapse forward. Uh, it's actually easier to do a vitrectomy uh, in this scenario than it is in a FACO. It doesn't have the tendency to prolapse forward as much, um, strangely. Okay, and in these situations, you want to use maybe a more rigid IOL that'll help keep tamponade the vitreous. Um, the most dreaded complication would be a suprachoroidal hemorrhage. Uh, so there are some risk factors, things like a one in the other eye or high myopia, multiple surgeries, glaucoma, the older that the patient is, any systemic vascular diseases, diabetes, anticoagulation. So this is a good point. I never stop anticoagulants in my cataract patients or my endothelial keratoplasty patients, but I do stop it in penetrating keratoplasty patients. So if they need cardiology clearance, I like to stop Coumadin, Plavix, aspirin prior to surgery. Intraoperative risk factors for suprachoroidal hemorrhage are things like vitreous loss or sudden ocular decompression, okay? Excessive manipulation of the sclera, like passing needles for uh, sutured IOLs, all these things can increase the risk. Um, also, the, if the patient has a higher blood pressure or they valsalva during the procedure, okay? These are risk factors. So you need to communicate with anesthesia. You need to let them know when the eye is open that they need to, you know, to be deep under and not the possibility of bucking on the tube. Um, here's a case, uh, a posterior pressure. Um, the patient was under a block and started kind of bucking forward when iris manipulation came. And we're just trying, it's not necessarily a hemorrhage, but it's, it's posterior pressure expulsion of ocular contents. And so you can see the lens in the Elschneg area here coming forward. And we're just trying to push it back, the, trying to get the patient under control. Ultimately, you have to just put your thumb over the eye, okay? There's this instrument called a coboperitoneal pr prosthesis. Uh, it doesn't always work great, but technically this can, can fill the hole and you can inject fluid in. Um, the problem is it's only one size, and so if your trephination is bigger, you're going to have problems. Um, so anyway, that's a dreaded complication. Um, um, additional questions we have from some of the staff audience preoperatively from uh, Shanawaz Kazi in India. They asked how to avoid suprachoroidal. So we talked about that just now. You want to look at the preoperative risk factors and minimize them, especially the anticoagulation size, uh, and you need to use general anesthesia if necessary. Uh, what's the role of avastin in, vascular, uh, in a vascular cornea? Uh, some doctors inject this preoperatively, and it does work. Um, the literature suggests that it decreases the corneal if you inject it subconjunctivally. However, the result is not long-term, right? You have to keep injecting it, so it's an issue. Some doctors laser. Steroids are, infect, uh, are effective long-term in decreasing vascularization. He also wrote... Uh, depot steroid and avoiding failure. So here's some subconjunctival kinolog. I don't like to do this at the time of transplant because you can't control the pressure. A lot of patients have post-op pressure spikes with transplants. And if you have this in the, in the conj, you don't know if it's coming from the graft or what, or if it's from this, and it's very hard to remove. So I don't mind um, like some, some, some steroid, like dexamethasone, subconj right after the case, but the depot steroids such as Kenalog, I don't like to do that in the transplant patients. And then avoiding endothelial loss in the surgery would be, you know, handling the tissue delicately using an, enough viscoelastic uh, in, the, in the bed here so that you don't have uh, trauma to the endothelium. Um, another question we had pre-webinar uh, pre was from Laila Awad in Jordan. It was, how, what do you recommend to increase the success for pediatric cases? Um, I don't really do pediatric, pediatric. I will do surgery on teenagers, but a pediatric transplant is a whole different animal, and it needs to be done with a team approach, preferably in an academic center in which you have a pediatric ophthalmologist and a glaucoma specialist because they have so many other you know, comorbidities. If you can get away with a lamellar surgery, like if it's for keratoconus, I would, um, because you're going to have overall higher success. But it's a very difficult case. Uh, pediatric surgeries, uh, pediatric keratoplasty, there's only, a, you know, really a handful of surgeons in the United States who do them because it's such a, it's such a niche uh, procedure. So um, we've got five minutes early. Uh, thank, you for your, um, thank you for your time. Here's a histology slide of the best part of the eye. So I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions here. Um, all right, so we'll start with uh, one that says, um, one of my patients 
uh, with PKP developed a retinal detachment with choroidal diffusion two months after surgery. He was non-diabetic, hypertensive. He was pseudophagic with coloboma iris with nystagmus. His vision was count fingers one feet. That sounds like a tough case. Um, if the patient had a coloboma in the iris, I would be suspicious if they had one in the retina as well. That could be the cause for an RD. Now, many patients can have uh, low pressure after surgery, causing a choroidal effusion without a transplant, uh, without a detachment. Uh, if you have a choroidal effusion, it means your pressure is low, and it's either two things. Number one, you got a wound leak, and you have to fix it, or number two, um, the eye has some ciliary shutdown. So you can get after surgery, just the shock of surgery, you can have the ciliary body stop making fluid. You'll get shallowing of the AC, you can get low pressure. That's treated with dilation, cycloplegia, and uh, with, uh, with intensive steroids, probably oral as well. All right, and then uh, Dr. Shaikh uh, writes, what about suture removal? When should we start removal? Any difference with children and adult? Um, um, yes, uh, like I said, I don't do pediatric keratoplasty, but those sutures need to be removed very much sooner than adults. They get a much more uh, um, uh, aggressive response to the sutures, not just with the scarring of the cornea, but also with uh, vessels and such. Um, in an adult, if you have a 16 uh, interrupted sutures, um, I think you can start around six months, maybe later. Um, in, my, in my process where I do 12 by 12, uh, 12 by running, 12 by interrupted, um, you can start at four months. Um, and I showed a little bit in the presentation about the using topography to guide suture removal. So um, any other questions? So Dr. Lehman, we'll wait maybe 30 more seconds. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Scheich sends another question. Can we start continuous in the beginning? Yes, the first transplants that were done, or not the first, but kind of what was popular in the 70s and 80s was a 21 byte uh, running suture. Uh, however, you still need to place cardinal sutures. You don't just start with a running suture. That that would be bad. So you can, some people use like 90, 90 nylon, which is easier to manipulate, and you use 90 to make the four cardinal sutures. You don't rotate the knots or bury them or anything. And then you put in the running suture. And once the running suture is in place, then you, then you remove those four initial 90 nylon sutures. <laughs> 